Hello there. Welcome to A to Zig. Today's program is Policy on Water. I have the pleasure of having with us today U.S. Congressman Dan Kildee, who uh, many of you know, and he is without a doubt an expert on uh, dealing with water issues. And he is going to join us to answer some questions and give everybody here an opportunity to see how we're doing in the Great Lakes region. So, Dan, thank you for being here. Thank you very much. A pleasure to, to be in your company. Absolutely. Fire up chips. That's right, fire yeah. up chips. Yeah, we're both uh, Chippewas from Central Michigan University. Not that that means anything to many of you, but if you're in the Central Michigan area, you know how big CMU is. It sure means a lot to me. Yeah, well, me too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so here's the first question. As a nation, what did we learn from the Flint water crisis? Well, it's a great question because I think it's yet to be determined how much we learned from it. What we should learn from it is really pretty simple to me, and it's that we should take nothing for granted. You know, for as long as I can remember, growing up as a kid and even all my time in local government, for the most part, we have taken for granted the fact that you go to the, to the sink, go to the tap, turn on the water, and it's going to be safe. The assumption is that all the systems are in place, that all the regulations are there, that all the capacity to make sure that it's drinkable, safe water have long since been established. I mean, this is the 21st century, the United States of America. Water's got to be safe. Yeah. We shouldn't assume that anymore. And Flint taught us that, I think. If we get the lesson of Flint, it's that we shouldn't take anything for granted. And I think that the other important lesson is that we have to learn that we're going to pay one way or the other for our failure to invest in these essential systems, in you know, essential infrastructure, water infrastructure in particular. We're going to pay one, one, way, one way or the other. Flint, just with the, the uh, government money that has been put forward, it's over a billion dollars. Wow. The failure in Flint. Yeah. And it would have cost a few dozen million dollars to prevent it in the first place. We're going to pay sooner or later. And so I think the lesson is we better get busy. We better start investing in water infrastructure. I'm going to try to circle back up to the prevention thing, but I have some other questions. That's a good point, though. Prevention is a lot sure. cheaper than spending a lot of money afterwards. No question. But I have a second question. What changes in water policy were you involved with as a U.S. congressman? Well, a few. I mean, coming out of the Flint water crisis, the biggest piece was getting the resources to fix the problems in Flint. And I was able to get legislation passed to supply a whole lot of money and to create the Flint registry, number one, to fix the water system in Flint to the extent it can be, but also to stand up the Flint registry, which is the process by which individuals affected by the water crisis can access the resources to help them get through it. That's one really big piece. You took care of the people. Took care of the people, and you, there's still more to do. But the, the, the most important um, uh, step was to deal with the crisis at a scale equal to the size of the crisis. We got a lot of resource. I would have preferred more, but obviously we had to do something. And in that point, I was in the minority in the U.S. House, and so it was particularly difficult to get this thing done. It took us about a year, but we did. Another really important piece of legislation that I was able to pass is one that I did with Congressman Fred Upton, and it's essentially referred to as the Kildee Upton uh, provision. And it corrects a weakness that helped contribute to the Flint crisis in the first place. That weakness being that when the EPA, which has regulatory authority over drinking water, um, passes that responsibility on to a state to, in, to enforce, what happened in Flint was because it was delegated, the responsibility for enforcement was delegated to Flint, even though, or to the state, even though the EPA was aware of the problems with Flint water, they never said anything. The state did not inform the citizens. In fact, we know the story there. The state did everything to keep the citizens of Flint from knowing that there were problems with the drinking water. Meanwhile, the EPA had that same information and didn't share it, didn't make it public. Our legislation, which is now law, requires the EPA 
to give 24 hours notice to the local governments, the state government, if they don't inform the public, then the EPA is then required to do so. Why is that such a big deal? Because if the people of Flint had known what was happening to them much earlier, they would have insisted on changes the way they did, and it would have prevented the crisis from being as serious as it was. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I, I do want to point out that Fred Upton is a Republican. Right. And you work with him in a bipartisan way, which I think is important. And he's on the west side of the state. He's on the west side of the state. In fact, you know, this is one of those things where it should never be partisan. Yeah. Access to drinking water, yeah. maintaining, protecting our Great Lakes typically is not a partisan issue. So the, the Kill the Upton provision, I did with Fred Upton. The actual amendment that got the resources for Flint uh, I did with John Molinar in a coordinated effort. He was a Republican in the majority. I was a Democrat in the minority. You know, half a decade later, yeah. I'm in the majority and John's in the minority, and he needed help dealing with the catastrophic dam failures that affected both of our districts, but primarily his, and we worked together on that. There's a lot we can do when we put aside some of our differences and don't let our differences cancel our ability to agree. I like that and I think everybody else does. I hope so. Yeah. Well, let me ask the next question. How does legislation like Build Back Better protect our nation's drinking water supply? In a really important way. I mean, between the bipartisan infrastructure law and what we hope to continue to do by expanding it and Build Back Better, we reinvest in 21st century water infrastructure. The big challenge that we face is that not all communities are capable of investing in their drinking water systems mm -hmm. equally. You know, the, the price of water varies from place to place. Communities that are older cities, that have had have population loss, for example, and have older systems, have a very difficult time investing in their water infrastructure, passing the costs on to their ratepayers, and not continuing to lose population because the price of the water it has to, be, has to uh, go up in order to accommodate that investment. So with the bipartisan infrastructure law and with Build Back Better, we recognize that clean water is a national issue, has national policy implications, and so we supply a lot of resources to communities through the Clean Water uh, Revolving Loan Fund, the Clean Drinking Water Revolving Loan Fund, which is administered at the state level, so that they can invest in their water systems without having to pass all of the cost on to their customers. That's especially important in impoverished communities with population loss and older water systems, because otherwise they will never be able to yeah. recover the cost of improvements. Yeah, yeah, that, that's very helpful. I'm sure that most communities need help. Most of them do. Now, yeah. a growing community that continues to be adding customers and new housing and new uh, commercial and industrial development, not as much because they can spread that cost sure. a, 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 across a growing population. But, you know, uh, drinking water can be really expensive. The irony, of course, of Flint yeah. is that it was simultaneously unsafe to drink and among the most expensive sources of drinking water in the whole country. Yeah, it's pretty ironic that it... Yeah, especially it, since we're surrounded by the Great Lakes. Right, right. 20% of the world's fresh water. So here's another question for you. Should the U.S. Congress, and I know you can't speak for all of Congress, but this is your opinion. Should the U.S. Congress be involved in updating the Safe Drinking Water Act? For sure. Okay. I mean, an act of Congress is a stronger policy uh, initiative than the actions of an administration, which can change with the changing elections. While, and so while we know that the federal government does have regulatory authority that it can use now to strengthen the Clean Drinking Water Act, in other words, to make a finding, just picking one subject, a finding that PFAS hmm. is dangerous in drinking water, even, even though right now there isn't anything in the law that requires that, the, the EPA would have the authority, under their normal regulatory authority, to make a finding that a dangerous substance is present in drinking water and that that, that would trigger you know, some enforcement action against a, a water system or a polluter. We think they have the authority to do that. We're pushing them to do everything they can. But it's preferable that we pass law that requires it. 
And that's why I've been one of the authors of the PFAS Action Act, which would force, at least as it relates to that family of chemicals, it would force federal regulations to regulate uh, groundwater, to regulate uh, safe drinking water, to yeah. make sure that where we find these chemicals, and of course PFAS is ubiquitous in the yeah. environment, but where we find them when they are at levels uh, that are unsafe, that ought to be dealt with. Right now, all we have at the federal <laughs> level uh, is an advisory level, and yeah. even that is, I don't think, aggressive enough, uh, even the level that the advisory relates to. Yeah, it seems as if the EPA is very slow at adding new chemicals to their list, and I, I think there's probably like a 20-year lag here that actually exists. So I think you're right. There's a reluctance on agencies, maybe because they're not sure or right. maybe they don't want to get into a political fight. Yeah, and I think it gets to sort of the, the philosophy of regulation in the first place, when it, especially when it relates to chemical contaminants. If the philosophy of regulation is that everything is safe, until it's absolutely proven otherwise, that's not the standard I think we want to have. We ought yeah. to take the standard that we apply common sense and realize that if we know, for example, that in certain instances PFAS has proven to be dangerous to human health, all we have to do is look at the exhaustive study in Parkersburg, West Virginia, where as a result of the contamination there, they did, as a part of their settlement agreement, a he, and the largest study of uh, one of the largest studies of human health impacted by a chemical contaminant ever thousands tens of thousands of people participated and PFAS was found to have really significant negative consequences certain cancers birth defects other disease were significantly more prevalent in people effect, uh, impacted by PFAS that's information that we have that ought to inform our thinking and too often what happens, and I've seen this in the hearings we've held in Washington, is that people in industry will say there needs, they'll say there needs to be more science, mm. more science, more yeah. science. Well, I agree there needs to be more science, but when we have enough information that we, that, that's actionable, we should take action. And at this point in time, we know enough about that dangerous family of chemicals that we ought to have a very high standard when it comes to drinking water and not assume that it's safe unless proven otherwise. But let's assume that chemicals like PFAS shouldn't be in drinking water and then get more science to determine whether or not there are trace elements that ought to be allowed or not. Yeah, yeah I, I think an epidemiologist would like to have data in real time and look at what's happening to the population health issues and then look at whether there's a relationship. Right. And, and, I, and I do think it does come to this question uh, of what our assumption is. Yeah. And the assumption should be that chemicals that have otherwise proven to be dangerous that can be kept out of drinking water ought to be kept out of drinking yeah. water. Yeah, and, and I think there's more interest in that now. I see the public is becoming much more aware. And maybe the Flint uh, event was really the one that at least in Michigan, made many people. It, now we have Benton Harbor, which yeah. is another one, and there are some other communities. Um, so here's another question. <coughs> this is a difficult question also. Considering that we have multiple federal programs already involved in the observation of Great Lakes water, do we need a federally sponsored water center to pull together all of the interested parties to develop a strategic plan for managing Great Lakes water quality and quantity. And that's something that the experts who I've talked to have said has not yet happened, yeah. but is like the next step in the evolution of all the things we're doing, like measuring quantity, measuring quality, uh, becoming much more aware of those things. So what do you think about that? I think it would be tremendously valuable. Number one, we sit right here in the, uh, surrounded by the greatest source of fresh water in the known universe. Now we always say it's the greatest source of fresh water on the planet. Yeah. It's the greatest source of fresh water in the known universe. Yeah. We might as well claim it, right? Yeah, yeah I would say so. <laughs> uh, and, and so I think we not only have the opportunity, yeah. but because of that an obligation uh, to continue an aggressive research agenda around 
the safety of the Great Lakes, the sanctity of those Great Lakes, how we preserve that water source for generations to come, but also some of the specific questions about how we manage such an incredible uh, water source are unanswered. I mean, I've traveled with some researchers at um, Central Michigan University mm -hmm. as research, a part of a research consortium yeah. of universities. There's a lot that we don't know about the best practices, the most effective way to preserve the Great Lakes, which by extension conserves drinking water, you know, helps with the economic impact that a fresh water source can have on our region. I think it's it's critical. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if people know it, but we have probably five or six universities that are involved in some piece of that here right. or there. But the, the bringing it all together is the uh, big issue, the big challenge, I think, uh, particularly since this is an evolving area. So when you uh, mentioned prevention, it, it made me think of public health. And... Uh, this is kind of off a little bit, but public health has been tested with COVID and other kinds of things. And I think we, we kind of discovered that public health needs some redefinition redef or whatever to deal with these kinds of things. And I know you've had a, a history with uh, public health uh, in the past. Do you think this is a role for public health maybe to become more involved with water and these other kinds of things? I think so. In fact, you know, I was in county government for a long time. Yeah, One of the what, things yeah. I, was, I was really proud of is that uh, we, we dramatically expanded the reach of our public health department to look at causation, to look at the environmental factors that ultimately do affect not just community health, but have an impact on individual health. Yeah. Um, and so I do think there's a, a, an important and legitimate role for public health agencies to think beyond simply providing services to people with health needs. Clearly that's part of the mission. But it's, it's a public responsibility, not just to pull people out of the river, but to move upstream and see where they're falling in, okay. to, to use a water I, metaphor. I like that, yeah, that's and so, true. And, and so I think that, yeah. that's what a, a public health agency has to balance. Mm -hmm. The resources that it places in filling the gaps in our health delivery system, which are real and yeah. we need to focus on, but also to try to find ways to positively affect public health, community health more generally, whether that is, you know, uh, like I said, identifying those those determinants of health, yeah. social determinants of health, and then realizing that there's a benefit to trying to address those. There's a social benefit, an economic benefit, and a health benefit that comes with, again, moving upstream, finding where we're losing people and where yeah. we're losing communities and trying to address it. Blight is a good example. Yeah. Blight has a health implication. Blight has an implication on, an effect on crime. It, it's dangerous. It has an effect on mental health. Those those elements that don't often look like they're part of a public health strategy really are, and we ought to think about it that way. Well, you spent a long time eliminating blight in communities. Uh, how, how do you think that can be uh, modified in the current uh, economic situation we're in? I mean, I think it has to be taken to scale, and this this kind of gets to one of the frustrations that I have as a policymaker is that very often policy is only justified when the financial return on the investment is immediate and completely within the confines of a small circle, like a, t a small time, a short time frame. Yeah. Whether it's blight elimination, public health, drinking water, early childhood education, all of these pieces that look like discrete policies have huge human and economic benefits that are realized five years, 10 years, 20 years, 40 years later. And for some reason, we've been so conditioned as a society to want gratification for every choice we make right now. If it's a business, it's gotta be the quarterly earnings statement. Mm -hmm. If it's in a government, it's gotta be before the next election. And we gotta stop thinking about the next earnings statement and the next election and start thinking about the next generation and the one to come after that. Yeah. And my, my frustration is we have to force that sort of metric into our policy making decisions 
if we do, not only do we make better choices, but I think we erase a lot of the differences that we have that right now I think are mostly played out on this shorter term, uh, through these shorter term questions. Yeah. We've got about five minutes left, and I, I've asked you a lot of questions, and I do appreciate the fact that you're answering them because, you know, all too often people say politicians, people who represent us, don't answer questions. And I've always known you to be a person that tries to find the answer and right. gives it. And I, I think I appreciate that very much. And I think many other people who know you also feel that way. Thank you. But what else do, do you feel is, is some of the, the bigger implications for public health, population health, as you see it from that, from within the beltway where you do a lot of your work? Well, I think, first of all, there has to be much more focus on environmental health because it does have a downstream impact on, like I said, every other aspect of the health of a community, of, of our society. There's a, there's a particular area that I think needs greater attention, and that is to bring greater parity to the way we deal with behavioral and mental health issues, uh, whether it's addiction or you know, other aspects of mental and behavioral health. They're often treated um, as, as sort of the conversation we don't have. Mm -hmm. it's, there's a lot of stigma mm -hmm. that, that uh, encircles uh, mental health, and there's a very serious connection between the mind and the body when it comes to our physical and our mental health. Very often one can negatively impact the other. Physical health can have a, a mental health impact. Untreated mental health issues can clearly have an impact on yeah. physical health. Yeah. But we don't spend enough time, money, or attention on those issues. And I think if, if I could wave my wand and fix one thing right now, it would be to destigmatize de mental health and provide parity for mental health care, for behavioral health care, for addiction treatment with other aspects of our health delivery system. Do you mind me asking you, because I know you went through the trauma right. associated with January 6th, how has that been for you? It's been really helpful. I mean, I, I went through that attack. The trauma I experienced was a one day, but there are people who experience that sort of trauma every single day, police officers, people who are veterans of the military. But I could see that it had an effect on me like it did, uh, that there are a lot of folks walking around with the invisible wounds of trauma that are going untreated. Yeah. I had some friends insist that I get treatment because they, they could see that I wasn't myself. Yeah. It was the best decision that I made because it's obviously allowed me to become myself again. And that's... Uh, that's a good thing. At least I think it is. Well, I, I think it is, too. I, I'm a psychologist, and I was traumatized just watching it. Yeah. And I think many people I've talked to had the same experience. So uh, it, it really was a event that uh, stands out uh, like so many others that are big events. So we've got about a minute to wrap up here. And first of all, I appreciate you coming in. For sure answering these questions and adding to our understanding of uh, water policy, but also the other things you talked about. And uh, is there anything else you want to say in closing? Well, first of all, thanks for bringing attention to water. Like yeah. I said, we take this stuff for granted. You ask what about Flint? Flint was not a, an anomaly. I mean, often it's treated like it was this outlier that, oh, that's terrible what happened to Flint. Good thing that can't happen to me. Everyone lives in Flint. No one is guaranteed clean drinking water. We have to be vigilant. We have to have policy that supports you know, communities having access to the most precious resource on the planet, that's water. Flint's not an anomaly. It was a warning, and I hope people heard it. Okay, thank you. Well, I want to thank everybody for uh, listening to this program, and uh, please share it with your friends. It's available on YouTube as well as streaming. And uh, if you uh, need to contact a congressman, how can they do that? You can go to my website. The best way to get to us is through my website, uh, dankildy.gov, uh, www, whatever it is. Just Google up Dan Kildee. You'll get it. All right. Thank you so much.